Well, good good morning, good afternoon, and, and good evening, everyone. Um, I see we've got uh, in the order of about 140 uh, participants joining us today, which we're delighted uh, to to welcome. I, we understand there's uh, folks uh, tuning in from from Canada, the United States, uh, France, and throughout Europe and and other countries. So we're delighted to uh, have uh, that level of interest for our our panel today. Uh, so on behalf of um, of, of uh, uh, the Institute for Peace and Diplomacy and InterVistas Consulting, I, I am pleased to welcome you to this webinar discussion entitled um, Privacy and Passenger Biometrics, New Developments and Perspectives. Uh, I'm Paul Clark of InterVistas Consulting and I'll be your moderator for the hour together. Uh, we're delighted to, to be able to bring together such a distinguished panel of global experts to discuss the opportunities and challenges in the deployment of facial recognition technologies and biometric data systems in air passenger travel and the associated policy issues and potential solutions connected to the use and protection of personal air traveler data. Before we move to our format and the speakers to hear uh, insights and perspectives on this key topic, I'd like to invite uh, Solomon Wong, our President and CEO of InterVistas, uh, to share a few opening remarks. Solomon? Thanks, Paul. I've had the opportunity of working with biometrics for over 24 years in a lot of different applications in travel and also security. And I think we're in an important time just because the narrative has moved to uh, a topic of whether we should ban biometrics or harness the, the power of the technology. And I think through the comments from Alan, John, um, Isabel and Jacqueline, I think we'll have some interesting practical ideas in terms of how to weather some of the different impressions of technologies that are informative not only to the subject at hand today on biometrics, but also some of the themes that we're moving into in terms of a touchless travel environment, health and other kinds of things through pand pandemic recovery. There's a lot going on right now from themes of the implementation of self-sovereign identity, um, the emerging standard from ICAO in terms of digital travel credential. And it becomes really important for governments, um, transportation operators, other stakeholders to come up with an ongoing discussion on improved practices. So without further ado, I'll turn it back to Paul to get us started. Thanks. Thank you. For Thank you very much, Solomon, uh, a great uh, scene setter. And uh, on behalf of Bijan Amadi, Executive Director of the Institute of Peace and Diplomacy, I know that uh, uh, the Institute are very excited with uh, the, the panelists and the event today. So, so thank you to Bijan and team for, for hosting. Um, so let's now turn to the main event. Uh, before I quickly introduce our distinguished guests, I, I thought it valuable just to provide a, a, a very quick overview of the format today. I'll ask our four panelists to share their, their thoughts and insights for about between seven and nine minutes each, and then we'll have a short question and answer session. If we have time, we'll also try to pose a few live audience questions and, and encourage you to provide your written questions for the panelists in the Q&A area at the bottom of your screen. It's, a, it's about the mid-level of the screen. And you, as while you're listening to Ellen, uh, John, Isabel, and Jacqueline uh, work through their particular mini presentations. Feel free in the Q&A area uh, to tap out your question for them. Uh, we'll do our utmost to try and answer a couple. If we uh, run out of time, uh, the panelists have kindly pledged to follow up with you. And so we're going to do a, a, a copy of the questions and we'll have panelists in the business days ahead uh, get in touch with you. Uh, to answer your questions if we don't have an opportunity today because we're on a quite time uh, sensitive uh, event schedule right now. Uh, now to our excellent speakers. Uh, you'll have found full bios on all of the speakers on the Institute's website. They've all had very long and distinguished uh, and impressive careers. <clears throat> I'll, I'll quickly introduce a panelist and then have them present for about seven to nine minutes. And then I'll, I'll then introduce the next panelist. I, I, I do that just to keep the pace going and we'll be able to work through the exercise um, in, in, in short order. <clears throat> so first up to the, the virtual stage will be Ellen McLean. 
uh, my, my distinguished colleague, Vice President with InterVistas Consulting. And, and uh, for Ellen, prior to retiring after a, a very distinguished and senior 30-year legal career with the US federal government, Ellen served the Department of Homeland Security as Deputy Assistant Secretary for Transportation Security and was formerly uh, Assistant General Counsel Enforcement um, as well. Ellen, without further ado, the, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Paul. Um, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Um, for the next couple of minutes, I thought that I would um, discuss the legal landscape with respect to privacy and the collection and use of biometric data um, in the air environment. Um, generally, a person's reasonable expectation of, of privacy is protected from government intrusion. But what about privacy um, and private industry in the commercial environment? How do lawmakers and courts view the balance between technology um, and privacy? The, the three biggest concerns appear to be um, breaches, uh, function creep, and data sharing. Uh, with respect to US national law, there is no comprehensive federal law regulating the collection and use of biometric data. The result is what, what commentators have called a patchwork uh, of federal laws that regulate um, sector specific um, things such as banking, health, um, false or deceptive practices, and, and COVID. In the absence of a national law pertaining to biometric data collection, um, the states have stepped in to fill the gaps. All 50 states have laws addressing breaches uh, and notification to the, the data subjects. But as one commentator noted, outside the treatment of data breaches, these laws are all over the map. Starting in 2008, a handful of states began to regulate the commercial collection and use of biometric data by companies. These states are Illinois, Texas, Washington, New York, Nevada, and recent, just last year, California. And even these are not uniform. All impose requirements regarding notice, consent, storage, retention, and sharing, but only California and Illinois allow private parties to bring an action for violation of those state laws. And as of this date, there are more than 200 cases pending in Illinois seeking monetary penalties under the law. And some of these are class actions, which means the potential for significantly higher civil penalty awards. Today, many reported court decisions have held that to bring an action under the law, otherwise known as, as standing, the plaintiff need only show a technical breach of the law rather than a specific harm or injury, making it easier in the long run for plaintiffs to sue. And if this were not unsettling enough, several courts have recognized the ability of a plaintiff to sue a company located in another state for a violation of the plaintiff's state law. Recently, Facebook agreed to settle a class action suit for $650 million, which was initiated in California for a violation of the Illinois state law. So the key takeaway here is that if you collect and use biometric data on a resident from one of those states, you may be required to implement changes and follow the requirements of the resident state or face potential stiff penalties, even if your business is not located in one of those states. Well, next I wanted to briefly take note of what's ha happening elsewhere in the world that could impact airport operators, carriers, um, and, and tenants in airports in the US. Specifically, I'm referring to the European Union and the General Data Protection Regulation, otherwise known as the GDPR. Um, my colleague, Isabel, on the panel will be addressing the GDPR in more detail, but I wanted to sort of lend um, a U.S. perspective. Um, among other circumstances, GDPR requirements can apply to a business processing personal data 
where, such as biometric data, where regardless of where the company is located or where the processing occurs, the processing relates to an offer of goods or services to EU residents. Last July, the European Court of Justice invalidated the EU-US Privacy Shield Agreement, which had provided some protection to US businesses that engaged in the transfer of personal data, including biometric data. The European Court of Justice ruled that US law inadequately protected personally identifiable data from US government agencies. In essence, they were concerned about the use of facial technology, facial recognition technology for surveillance purposes. The impact is that if you transfer data pertaining to EU persons, you must either stop or adopt EU GDPR approved mechanisms. Some companies like William Sonoma or Pottery Barn um, have elected to stop doing business in the EU. Um, I would also note that there are at least 28 countries that have enacted legislation or promulgated regulations governing biometric data. So an observation from where I sit, um, US laws are for the most part focused on imposing um, requirements and restrictions on commercial entities versus the EU, where the emphasis is on protecting data subjects' rights and empowering them as owners of the data. Bottom line is that you need to stay current and comply with emergency, emerge, I knew I was gonna do that, emerging, <laughs> emerging privacy law trends pertaining to the enactment of state laws um, and other nations requirements if you collect and use or propose to collect and use um, biometric data on customers who reside within or outside of your state. Um, now, turning um, just briefly to privacy principles and best practices, there's an extensive history of principles um, designed to offer guidance on the protection of personal data, such as the Fair Information Practice Principles, or, or FIPS, from the 1970s, or Privacy by Design from the 1990s, and subsequently a number of other uh, similar approaches. Many of these principles or best practices have a number of basic elements in common, such as build privacy and security protections into technology, policies, practices, and systems. Limit the scope of collection to lawful and relevant data. Make sure you address in a clearly communicated way policies on notice, consent, retention, sharing, access, and amendment. Ensure that your policies and practice, practices allow for reasonable accommodation required by law, such as Americans uh, with Disabilities Act or religious reasons. Um, identify and address any applicable union issues um, and meet with privacy and civil liberties groups as warranted and legislative representatives to address and appreciate any privacy uh, concerns. Many of these principles have been incorporated into US law and internationally, so that by complying with them, it may place you on sure footing under the law. Now, with respect to the collection and use of biometrics in the air environment, as you are aware, stakeholders have a wide range of, of options um, from managing your workforce uh, with time keeping and CIDA badging to controlling access to secured areas to facilitating passengers' experience from curb to boarding and providing retail services. I, the, the bottom line is you need to ask whether the use of uh, biometric, the use and collection of biometric data um, is key to your business. Um, with the increase, expected increase in the use of biometric data, uh, including facial recognition uh, and the anticipated benefits and efficiencies from its use in the aviation industry, Stakeholders need to find the right balance uh, of privacy protections and technological applications that in turn um, comply with applicable law. Uh, and Paul, that, that concludes my remarks. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellen. Uh, a, a great uh, scene setter for us all here. Um, important topics. Uh, second up to speak will be John Wagner, uh, President and CEO of uh, John Wagner Consulting, 
Uh, John served with U.S. Customs and Border Protection for 29 years before his retirement last summer as former Deputy Executive Assistant Commissioner in Field Operations, he was a recognized leader and innovator in automating and re-engineering border management and passenger facilitation, developing global entry, automated passenger con uh, passport control, and the vision for leveraging facial recognition technologies. Uh, John, the virtual floor is yours. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, you know, thanks for having me today. And, uh, and like Paul mentioned, I retired out of CBP uh, last July. So I'm here to speak about, uh, you know, some of my experiences and recollections and, and some of the things we worked on. But clearly, I want to make sure that I'm not speaking on behalf of CBP or even advocating on their behalf or speaking for them uh, in my comments this morning. But I did want to start with a, a passage I used uh, when testifying before Congress a couple of years ago on this very topic. And I said, you know, when, when people travel internationally, they usually move through defined channels or portals. They may seek to acquire a passport. They may apply for a visa. They may stop at ticket counters, gates, exit controls at airports and seaports. Upon arrival, they pass through inspection points. They may transit to another gate and get on an airplane. And each of these checkpoints or portals is a screening a chance to establish that people are who they say they are and are seeking access for their stated purpose. The job of protection is shared amongst these many defined checkpoints. By taking advantage of them all, we need not depend on any one point in the system to do the whole job. The challenge is to see that the common problem across agencies and functions and develop a conceptual framework in architecture for an effective screening system. Throughout government and indeed in private enterprise, agencies and firms at these portals confront recurring judgments that balance security, efficiency, and civil liberties. These problems should be addressed systemically and not in an ad hoc fragmented way. So if anybody recognizes that passage, it comes out of the 9-11 Commission Report. And this really was the genesis of CBP's involvement with biometrics, because the commission recommended, and there were multiple pieces of congressional legislation after that, that required DHS and CBP to develop and implement a biometrics-based departure control system. Uh, and as everyone knows, there's no departure controls in the United States at the airports. Uh, unlike a lot of countries around the world, you don't see a, a CBP officer or a border control officer. You don't have your passport stamped. So there's no discrete process where it made it easy to collect biometrics uh, in that departure environment. You had the commingling of international and domestic passengers. So all the efforts up to, you know, for several years, the DHS tried to approach us. They looked at it in that sort of standalone uh, stoved piped uh, approach that it was a discrete process to collect biometrics and not really integrate it with the rest of what government or the airlines or the business models of what was already going on. So when CBP took this over uh, several years back and Congress funded it through some fee structures, uh, we, we, we kind of took a fresh look at this and you know, we, we looked at it and said, well, what data do we already have? What information do we already have on passengers? Airlines are already collecting and providing information to the governments. We've already had an assortment of biometrics on people, either from their previous arrivals or from their, their, their application for documents like the passports. So is there a way we could combine all this and create a system, create an, an ecosystem where multiple pieces of that process could participate? in a way that was simple for people and didn't require people to continue to have to provide information over and over and over again. Um, so we built a system, we called it the Traveler Verification Service. Um, it took data we had already had on people, meaning the photographs. We had a photograph of everyone traveling internationally by way of their passport, their visas, their previous arrivals uh, in the US. So for the great majority of the passengers, we already had a photograph. So this was the, piece of information people already provided to the government for the purposes of travel. The airlines were already tell CBP who's flying in or out of the country. So could we develop a system? And this is what we did is we, we took that manifest from the airline, took all the photographs out of our repositories of what people already provided to us, 
and created a small gallery of just who's on that flight or just who's flying in and out of the airport that day. So when the traveler actually shows up at the airport, it was as simple as putting a camera there, taking their picture and only searching against the people in that small gallery. So the results were quick, they were accurate, it was efficient. It was really easy for people to engage with the technology. There was no really no new learned behavior at the airport. Everybody knows how to take a picture, right? I've said that many, many times. But you look at the camera, you smile, and you're approved. But the important part here is there's already requirements that you have to establish your identity at the airport, and in some cases, your citizenship too. These are not new requirements. This is much different, and we can talk about this later, than the use of technology or this facial recognition technology in a public space where there may be no requirement to carry identification or to establish your identity or your citizenship absent uh, probable cause or reasonable suspicion from a, you know, through an interaction with a law enforcement officer. But utilizing this technology in an airport space is different because the authorities already exist to establish your identity. Here we're using, we were using a new tool to help our CBP officers and other officers and staff members at the airports um, conduct that identity verification that was already going on manually. So in some sense, we were just automating a process that was already manually done. And if you thought about all the different points in the airport, coming or going, that you have to show your passport or show your boarding pass or show some piece of identification to proceed to the next step, that could potentially be replaced with just a camera taking a picture and pinging that gallery. And also the person at that, say, gauntlet or gate or, or, or process gets a red light, green light. Yes, the person's approved and no, the person's not approved. And check the document manually then. Revert back to the process that goes on today. Um, so could you set this up at the various points within that process too? And that's what we were working on uh, to be able to do that. Uh, we built a system that everybody could participate in. It wasn't just one single government-owned, government-controlled system. It was multiple vendors, multiple stakeholders, airports, airlines. Uh, you know, everyone could have a piece of building this and engineering this and tailoring it to their own business needs. And we could build a tokenless, a touchless in terms of COVID and pandemic travel, a hygienic process, because you really didn't need to produce a document of any sort to travel in or out on international travel, because your data is, is already residing in that approved system. Now, as far as regulatory work and notifications, the government produced privacy impact assessments, systems of record notices. They described all of this information, this data collection, where the data is stored, how it's not stored, US citizen photographs were were deleted after a short period of time. There was no need to hold on or retain that new information because the passport picture was there. Um, so all of this was out there. We were working on how do we better notify people though, put signs at the airports, but we know nobody reads signs at airports. You know, so gate announcements, could it, other ways to message to people to understand what was required? What were the different ways to require this? What happens if they don't opt out? What are their, what are their options you know, in travel? But by and large, we were trying to build a system that was simple and efficient and could be scaled in a way that would really start to meet the increases demand in travel. And then as we enter into, into COVID and the, the, see the, the, the impact that COVID has had on travel and international travel, as they start to resume from this, what are the opportunities to have a more hygienic and touchless process? And that's what a lot of people, including CBP, continue to build out today. So with that, I'll pass it back and happy to uh, answer any questions in the follow-up. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, John. Uh, you know, tremendous uh, overview of uh, your, your your pioneering work and, and the, the challenge at hand. And I, I did see actually, um, we, we won't get to it, but I, I see that uh, Tarek has uh, started the process in the Q&A with questions and hopefully we'll have an opportunity at the end to, to have questions. So just an encouragement to, as you're listening to the speakers, uh, if you have thoughts or questions, please pop them in, in the, the, the question and answer session. And thanks to Tarek for setting us off there. Um, uh, third up to speak, and, and again, she's been very gracious to speak in English uh, as opposed to French, and, and we're very thankful uh, to, to Isabel for her multi-language skills. Um, third up to speak will be Isabel Lillelure, and uh, she's a partner lawyer with uh, Chevrier Avocat, 
uh, which is a Paris-based firm specializing in aviation law. Um, in an impressive career spanning over 20 years, uh, Isabel was formerly head of the legal departments for Vinci uh, Airports Group and the French Airport Association, and has held positions with the European Union and Air France. Uh, Isabel is recognized as a leading lawyer representing the airport and aviation sectors, primarily in Europe, specializing in contractual issues and other key areas, including data protection, uh, GDPR and aviation policy. Uh, so without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, my colleague uh, Isabel to uh, present uh, her, her thoughts today. Thank you very much, Isabel. Thank you very much, Paul. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, just to, I want to thank Intervisas Consulting and in particular uh, Marcelo Garcia and, and Paul Clark for the invitation. And of course, it's a pleasure to, to have the opportunity to speak about this interesting and, and rather controversial uh, issue today. So um, as you know, for several years now, uh, biometric data systems have been more and more used in the airport business and nearly 60% of the airlines and airports in the world have already deployed facial, facial recognition uh, technologies as well as fingerprints images. So um, the idea is that, uh, well, this presentation will address the EU legal uh, ground for data protections and to what extent biometric data are subject to uh, special protection. But first, let's see what are the three main illustrations of the use of biometric data systems. Uh, primarily, some system uh, allowed to make the different airport control stage, stages automatic in sub substitution to identity and travel document control. One example is, the, is related to the, to the border control with what we call in French the PARAF e-gates, which is similar to the American clear security checkpoints. And it's located uh, at the immigration checkpoints, of course, and in many airport departure and arrival halls. We can find it in major EU airports such as London Heathrow or Paris Charles de Gaulle, Lyon, Nice, Marseille, etc. And this system replaces manned immigration stations and instead uh, requires the user to, to self-operate the device. One key benefit of using the system is that it can really speed up the departure and arrival process with less uh, time going. Biometrics are also used by airports and airlines, either in the purpose of facilitations, uh, allowing to identify the exact locations of the passenger in the airport to avoid late boarding, or um, to improve the passenger airport uh, journey experience, uh, which sometimes monitor, studies the consumer passenger's behavior along his airport journey uh, in order to, air, to, to adapt the airport commercial offer. One example, one very recent example has been implemented in Lyon uh, with a system called Mona, and it's a passenger mo uh, mobile personalized assistance based on facial recognitions and it escorts the passengers at each step uh, uh, of the process from his travel preparation at home uh, up to until his installation in his uh, flight seat, basically. Um, the third illustrations are surveillance cameras using facial recognition of all people uh, present in the airport public space. And as we'll see, the legit legitimacy of each of the three biometric systems depends, of course, of its, on its purpose. So uh, now that we have recalled the different illustrations, uh, what is the legal ground in, in the EU? So as, um, as uh, Ellen has uh, uh, addressed already, uh, and as most of you know, the legal ground for data protection in Europe is what we call the GDPR, which is a general data protection regulated dated of 27 April 2016. Uh, and, and this regulation directly applies in, uh, in all EU member states. We also have a directive in the EU 
uh, related to data protections, but specifically uh, regarding the criminal offenses. But since the GDPR uh, applies for all other data processing, we will focus, this presentation will, will focus only on GDPR. So what's the idea? What, what does the regulation state? Um, actually, it recognizes biometric data for the purpose of uniquely ident uh, identifying a natural person as a sensitive data. Uh, why is it sensitive? Because uh, they are produced by the body itself and characterized in a definitive way. Uh, they are unique, permanent, and no one can cover wing it up. Um, they are not granted by third party, neither by the individual itself, uh, contrary to own, any other data. Uh, it cannot be modified, of course, in case of data hacking, like a password. And it's a contactless technology and can be used remotely, potentially without informing the person, the data subject. So that's an issue. And for all this reason, the EU makes the biometric data uh, subject to a special protection. So the rule, actually, the rule in the EU is a prohibition of biometric data processing. And only um, a limited number of conditions uh, applies under which uh, such processing is lawful. In other words, it's lawful and uh, only if it, in it includes strong safeguards to protect data protection. Uh, so there are several prerequisites in the GDPR. Um, I cannot go through all of them, but the main ones are the, the following. Actually, you, the, the first one is the necessity and proportionality of the biometric data processing. It should be uh, necessary for the purpose of, leg of a legitimate interest, which is a notion assessed on a case-by-case -case basis, of, of course, and only if a data controller proves such legitimate interest, the data processing will be authorized. Uh, we have, um, I mean, such system has been validated, uh, for instance, for biometric systems such as paraf e gates or clear security checkpoints for border control, as it reduces waiting times for passengers and document fraud. It has been validated as well uh, in case of facial recognition system to facilitate aircraft boarding. Um, however, uh, the legitimate interest has not been recognized uh, in case of using surveillance cameras, using facial recognition of all people present in the airport public space. Uh, this is a very controversial issue and not uh, really well recognized by, by na uh, EU as well as national authorities and courts. Actually, this last illustration uh, relates to the mass surveillance issue and, and EU authorities tend to consider that the use of biometric technologies for untargeted mass, uh, mass processing of special categories of personal data, and in particular, the biometric data in public space, creates serious uh, risk of mass, mass surveillance. Uh, it infringes on fundamental rights, uh, such as data protections, privacy, uh, equality, even freedom of expression sometimes. Uh, and definitely do not meet the required justification or thresholds of necessity and proportionality, as we mentioned before. Uh, all other principles of GDPR, of course, apply to biometric data systems, such as the minimization of data and limitations. Uh, in other words, you should only use the data you need for the purpose of the legitimate interest and no more. Um, so that's, that's really crucial for, for the assessment. Um, so once the necessity, the proportionality, the minimization of data are all verified, the other main uh, uh, criterion is the, is the consent. Of course, the data subject shall have given explicit consent to the processing of those personal data for one or more uh, specific purposes. And such consent shall be specific, clear, and, and well, specific to the, to the biometric data processing. That's crucial. And, and, and finally, the individual shall be able to choose between the data biometric systems and other means of authentications without any additional constraints, like uh, additional costs. This alternative means is, uh, is, uh, is mandatory. 
This can be as well uh, necessary, actually, uh, in case people cannot use a device such as a PRM, you know, the, the passengers with reduced mobility. So that's important. So again, once the legitimate interest is evidenced, uh, as well as all other criteria, um, the biometric data processing can be validated. As long as the data a controller actually uh, stores the data on a device on which natural the natural person has uh, an exclusive control. This is the case, of course, uh, on a, for instance, on a secured mobile application on a cell phone or an ID card or, or, or key card. If, it, if it, this is not stored on a device uh, on which the passenger has an exclusive control, it has to be stored on a device under an encrypt format that make it unusable without a specific information provided by the passenger himself that would, that would allow to decrypt it, actually. Um, the biometric data shall be stored as well for a very limited period of time solely for the time uh, necessary for achieving the identified purpose, you know, this legitimate interest, then the data shall be destroyed. That's very important. I have several examples, but I'm afraid I'm not, uh, I don't have much time to, to address them, but we can discuss them uh, later. The, the, the last point is that the controller shall proceed with a data protection impact assessment prior to the processing. And this assessment shall include the legal regime of, of each of the data processing. So just to sum up, among the three main use of air passenger uh, biometric systems, we can easily conclude that the EU and uh, all in individual EU member states uh, consider that e-gates for border controls are legitimate, uh, data are, are not stored, and the interest is evident. Um, Passenger journey facilitation is relatively well admitted as well, as long as the GDPR provisions are scrupulously fulfilled. And, and finally, camera surveillance in public space is very controversial issue, and the EU, as well as most EU states, are against this use. My final word will be, uh, what is the risk, actually, of non-compliance with GDPR? Um, that's, that's a major point, of course, and infringement shall be subject to administrative uh, fine up to 20 million euros, or in case of undertaking, it can be up to 4% of the total worldwide annual turnover of the present financial year, whichever is higher. And in addition to that, member states can foresee additional uh, penalties of criminal nature that can lead to prison sentence. So to conclude, um, given the penalty risk and, and the increasing use of biometric data systems, uh, most EU undertakings, as well as many non-EU entities, uh, have engaged in, into a GDPR compliance program uh, uh, to avoid uh, the infringement. That's it for now, and thank you, Paul. Thank you very much, Isabel. A, a, a tremendous uh, explanation of uh, GDPR, and, and and as you can see uh, from a European perspective, uh, uh, you know differences and in, in perspectives and philosophies on on uh, protection and privacy. Um, but a, a, a tremendous explanation of that, Isabel, and some of the opportunities and, and challenges ahead. Um, uh, before turning over to Jacqueline, I, I just wanted to, to thank John, uh, as well as some of the other panelists. Uh, uh, we've got um, uh, the Q&A is underway, and uh, I see that John has answered uh, three of the questions so far, which is, which is wonderful. So, uh, Tareg, uh, Dave, and, and as an, an anonymous um, a questionnaire, uh, please uh, just look at the answers there as well. So, thank you for keeping that active and live, and thanks, John, for responding. Uh, uh, without further ado, um, uh, fourth up to speak uh, will be Jacqueline Liu, uh, who is co-founder of Helpful Places and is also data lead at uh, the Mozilla Foundation. Um, at Helpful Places, uh, Jacqueline is building a coalition to implement and improve digital transparency in the public realm, DTPR. Uh, DTPR um, is an open source communication standard uh, for digital technology that enables uh, agency for people in, in the real world out there in, in active spaces by advancing greater transparency, 
civic dialogue on the use of digital technologies. Um, Jacqueline has another perspective to provide. Uh, she's not a, an aviation uh, uh, policy person or, or, or airport specialist uh, by, uh, by training, but uh, has a very uh, a powerful and provocative way of uh, communicating messages on uh, this space. And, and we thought it was a, a tremendous opportunity to have uh, Jacqueline address the, the group in this topic as well. So uh, Jacqueline, without further ado, uh, we'll turn over to yourself and I understand you've got some comments and slides. Thank you, Jacqueline. Yeah, great. Um, thanks for the opportunity. Um, yeah, this is uh, so now for I, th I think I'll just say now for something a little bit different, <laughs> or a slightly different take on the conversation. Um, so far, I think the question in my mind when I think about the evolution and the development of, you know, best practices and regulations and, um, you know, global standards, the question that comes to me is, um, how do we think about solving the needs of people um, when it comes to these embedded technologies? in the built environment and with this question of passenger, passenger biometrics and absolutely the question of you know surveillance and technologies and um, in the public realm and in more publicly accessible spaces is you know how do we actually Im like imagine that we can empower people to understand kind of the why and the how of um, their data processing kind of like by whom and kind of under what types of um, regulations. And so to that end, um, yeah, I'm excited to be able to share um, this this um, DTPR, which we didn't intend it to be a play on GDPR, but it just kind of turned out that way. Um, and <laughs> we definitely, it was, it was really kind of like thinking about um, how do we improve digital transparency in the public realm? Um, but then I think as we kind of furthered the project, really started thinking about um, how are we actually enabling um, digital trust um, in places and routines. And so um, I am kind of more of a visual person, so I'm going to kind of pull up this um, slide deck for folks to look at. And I think the fundamental problem that, you know, all the other panelists and, and, and is kind of more commonly known in the world is that, you know, digital is invisible in the built environment, but there's really little um, transparency about kind of what is being collected by whom and for what purposes. And while in, you know, multiple jurisdictions, and this is, um, uh, there, there are regulations that extend privacy protection to the offline world, and we've heard about a lot of those efforts today. Um, you know, the mechanisms for notification and accountability are kind of largely absent or inconsistent, and signage that kind of does appear are long paragraphs of text or kind of small snippets that give little venue to follow up and ask more questions. And so when we embarked on kind of this open source project, we had kind of like as a top principle that um, we believe that people should be able to quickly understand how these technologies work and the purposes that they serve, um, which are, you know, core to answering so many questions around kind of like, um, you know, that, that are asked by a privacy impact assessment, for example. And what we have um, in the world right now is really a bunch of like ad hoc approaches. Um, and what we started imagining is how can there be systematic implementation so that um, we can kind of learn from each other into what actually works um, to help build trust because the impact of that fragmented approach um, actually contributes to um, that reduction in trust and through kind of different rounds of um, kind of design, de design led prototyping and research and kind of um, we, we've started to begin to adopt an understanding of, of how that actually works from the design perspective. And it starts with transparency, um, but transparency isn't really kind of good enough. People are really looking for accountability, but accountability feels hollow unless there's actually true agency. And so this is really kind of how we think about how these different layers kind of ladder up to um, enabling trust in these systems. So, um, and that understanding that we started to develop through, through the design research is embedded in, for kind of lack of a better word, a, a product. And so at its core, what we've put together is this um, standard dictionary of concepts for tech and data practices. And it's a set of icons that express those concepts in a visual way. And the idea is that this taxonomy of concepts would build up a kind of people legible description of sensors and systems 
systems and places that can then be made available to folks um, through through a number of ways. And I think um, this is just like important to note is that we very much um, took this design thinking approach. It was drafted by experts, but explicitly refined through iterations of prototyping and user testing where we were trying to put these ideas out in front of real people um, to kind of get their feedback and bring that back to contributors in an active cycle. And this, this is kind of what it looks like. It's a unified visual language that we think is a starting point. We were very much inspired by the eff efficacy of actually transportation symbols in places like airports where you know um, you can go anywhere in the world and understand how the space works and how to use it um, but then coupled with digital tools would help people to follow up um, learn more and provide feedback and kind of which icons or which pieces of information were important to put on the signs were validated um, by the user research itself and this is kind of what that um, looks like when we piloted um, the system with the city of Boston this summer. So you could actually, you know, scan this QR code and it brings you to, um, you know, this prototype where you actually, so this is trying to bring the idea of layered notices um, into this actually span the physical and the digital. Um, and we tried to present kind of information around data processing in, in kind of like a consistent way in this data, in this, what we call this daisy chain um, and, and kind of really try to think about how this can be deliberately people legible um, and as a kind of early attempt at looking at agency, you kind of give people a way to um, provide feedback and, and kind of find out more. And so I think um, when we think about, you know, what, that's kind of where we are now, but when we think about the future, um, out of one of the open kind of prototyping sessions that we had came and ask um, from one of the contributors to envision how the standard might work in kind of five years and our research exploring those mechanisms of accountability and agency led to um, increasing excitement for the prospect of a personal AI assistant. Um, and as a communication standard, um, if deployed at scale, we imagine that um, you know, this, this could serve as the foundation from which personal AIs could actually provide um, deeper control over our interactions in the real world. And so you can imagine that, you know, you have your digital assistant with you everywhere you go and you enter a place that uses the system, you're given a link, you can ask questions, you can kind of see what services are available for you to interact with and um, how everything works is kind of fully described and available because it's been described using this standard and you can learn more about all of the systems in a place, you can kind of keep it high level or start to drill down and, and get specifics. Um, you can also ask questions about what might be around you or, or what else is here or access services um, and think about actually having control over these embedded technologies and, and enabling new types of experiences there. And so in this future, at the end of the day, you can kind of also review your transactions and interactions and maybe um, update your preferences. So um, that's really the vision of the future where the existence of this communication standard can actually create new types of experiences. And so um, I think the question I have for this group is that while it's clear that, you know, there is a need for regulatory standards around kind of how these technologies are used in a transportation context, um, how do we extend that thinking towards communication standards um, that enable, you know, digital literacy and understanding that kind of help build trust in those digital systems and if adopted at scale would actually help enable seamless, touchless experiences and travel environments that um, don't just kind of ease the journey, but actually can help travel be delightful. Um, and so, you know, this is the coalition that um, we're building. And um, that's basically kind of my presentation. Um, so yeah, so something a little bit different. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Jacqueline. Actually, th this is tremendous food for thought, because it, it, it talks about uh, bring it to the element of uh, the human experience. We've got so much technology, so much opportunity but it's that application and the interpretation from a human element, the, the, the voice of the customer, the voice of the consumer, the voice of the public participant. And it provides a, an, another 
uh, very important lens to the equation here as well. Um, so thank you very much, Jacqueline, uh, tremendous stuff. Um, at this point, we've, um, I'm going to turn to a, a couple of uh, quick questions. Uh, again, thanks to uh, John and Isabel for answering live in the Q&A uh, component for, um, uh, you know, we've got questions from a number of our audience members that I, I believe are being answered uh, very quickly. And I, I know, Ellen, there's, there's one for you as well. But <clears throat> what, what I wanted to do is um, just get a, a, a bit of a conversation going here among, amongst us all um, on, on the panel. I think the first question is for, for Ellen. Um, just in reflecting and listening, and how do we prevent the, the, the kind of proliferation of hundreds of national laws for the, the collection and use of biometric data and the protection of privacy of, of data subjects and to avoid multiple sets of laws applying to air industry entities doing business globally? Well, I, you know, I think history shows that that, that at least since the early 60s, right, that international organizations have been collaborating on trying to answer that very question. Um, I think in the United States, Congress uh, for the last you know, decade or so has introduced a number of bills um, to try and have that kind of uniform national law so that you don't get 50 different laws that the companies need to comply with. The problem isn't about the desire or the will. The problem is about what provisions to include. Do you mm -hmm. go with the California model, with, which is most like the, the GDPR, or do you go with something more, uh, I'll call it benign? Um, and it's interesting to note that... Um, that I won't name it, I, <laughs> but there's a couple of giants in the tech industry that are pushing for a national law. And I think the reason is because they're wrestling with the prospect of having to satisfy 50 states laws and they're, they want to control the dialogue and have a role in what that national law looks like. Um, so I think the next couple of years, it'll be a pretty interesting debate um, in the U.S. Congress um, to see what we end up with. And I think we will end up with something um, that, that probably will supplant the, and replace the, the state laws that are out there for one national uniform comprehensive you know, privacy law on, on biometrics. Thanks for that, Ellen. And, and maybe as an extension of that, I ju just would like to ask John from your experience at, uh, in your career and, and a lot of intersect between government, industry and, and the public. Um, how, how can governments better inform industry and the travelling public on the details of systems and approaches to, to gain confidence in the use and deployment of this type of technology? So first and foremost, they can you know follow their existing requirements. You know, publish your privacy impact assessment, and I just sent out the link to the the latest CBP one in the Q and A. If if anyone wants to read that, or you can find it on the CBP and DHS websites. You, know, you do your systems of record notice, and you know in the in these publications, you articulate well. What's your authority to even collect this information, right? Because you always need that that approval from Congress, that authorization, those statutes that even allow you to engage in this type of of, of work, um, and then through the regulatory process, you also publish regulations. Uh, CBP was in in the process of doing so, you know, drafting a proposed rulemaking. It goes out for public comment. They take all the comments in and then publish what's known as a final rule. Then it becomes regulation. Um, Absent those, though, for people who don't read those kind of publications or aren't studying that kind of stuff, you know, we were trying to work with the, you know, when I was there, we were trying to work with um, the airlines and the airports to just better notify people in plain, simple terms, you know, what is required, what's mm. optional, how do you opt out, what happens if you don't opt out, um, you know, where does your data go? Why is it being stored? Is it stored or is it not stored? So this was, you know, signage at the gates, um, you know, uh, announcements by the gate personnel at the airlines. Uh, you know, we had talked about other possible ways. And these were some of the discussions I had. I had met with um, uh, 
big groups of the privacy representatives. I did a couple meetings in Washington. I went out to San Francisco, met with all the, the privacy groups and their advocates to get that kind of feedback. Because in government, we didn't know how to do this kind of stuff. So, you know, let's talk to the experts. What can we do better to notify people in terms they're going to digest and understand, mm-hmm. you know, and mm-hmm. knowing that when people travel, they're focused on getting on board the plane or getting out of the airport. And they're not going to stop and read this technical sign, uh, you know, with all these requirements. So, you know, could you do things like print it on the, on, on your boarding pass or on your electronic boarding pass on your phone, or could you have notification from the airline, you know, through that electronic medium that you're using to, to do that. Um, you know, were there other opportunities, maybe at booking the flight, you know, booking the ticket, um, you know, to notify people and explain to them, you know, are there things you could do on the plane signage or within the airport, you know, when you're sitting on the train or the mobile lounge or the bus, could you have signage? So there's lots of possible ways. Uh, you know, I think th- there's always work to be done and to better improve that, but it's more about informing people in real simple terms that they can digest. Yeah, thank you. And I, I saw uh, Jacqueline nodding away. Uh, I'm sure she's got <laughs> lots of thoughts and applications on how to communicate those messages. But, um, but, but, but really pioneering territory, John, as you say, you know, just uh, look at other ways to engage with uh, with industry, with uh, with the public on that. But um, and I'll have a question for you in a moment, uh, uh, Jacqueline. I, I know we're getting uh, tight on time, but um, I just wanted to turn to Isabel and, and you. Isabel was very kind to um, actually type out an answer to one of the uh, audience members that kind of in this area, I think it was Clint. Um, it's in the area of, um, you know, the GDPR and having uh, or, or may have uh, an extra territorial application uh, beyond the European Union. And could you clarify uh, what's behind that, Isabel? And, and, and if so, to what extent does the GDPR apply to a US, Canadian, and, or other non-European Union airport operator? Uh, yeah, actually, that's a very interesting uh, question, Paul, as it's in, this is indeed one of the particularities of the GDPR. Uh, its territorial scope uh, indeed goes beyond the EU and may apply to non-EU entities. Uh, it, because GDPR can have a direct application and, and an indirect one. Uh, it can have a direct application in case in non, uh, non-EU entity, uh, a US airport or uh, Canadian airlines, uh, as an establishment in the EU. An establishment can be only one office with, with one employee, actually. And in such a case, uh, if it's as an establishment in the EU, uh, or a data processor located in the EU, regardless of whether the processing takes place in the union or not, um, uh, GDPR applies actually. To give you an example, if for instance, a US airlines um, creates an e-business website in the US and as an office in Paris involved in this e-business website, uh, GDPR will apply. Um, and well, actually, in practice, airlines may may be more impacted than airports, as most of them as an office in many EU member states. Um, uh, we can have a direct application as well regarding the, the targeting criterion, in a sense that GDPR applies to the processing by non-EU uh, entities of personal data of people who are in the in the union and where the processing activities actually relates to the offering of goods and service to such data subjects in the union or monitor uh, their behavior as far as their behavior takes place within the union. So again, uh, if we take an example of, of course, uh, for instance, Air Canada, who offers to a person located in the union and intends uh, specifically to offer the service to this person, to this person located in the EU, um, GDPR uh, applies. Uh, it, it might uh, be the case, for instance, of marketing campaigns targeting consumer, consumers uh, be, uh, located in the EU. Um, uh, and, 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 or, or, for instance, uh, Canada um, collecting in Canada uh, passenger biometric data and using this data to understand the passenger behavior, uh, the passenger spending uh, habits. 
uh, and in that case, GDPR will will have to apply. So, so that's that's uh, that's very important for non-EU entities to comply with GDPR, and and many of them uh, have already implemented, as I was mentioning before, some GDPR uh, program to to make sure they they they, they don't have uh, much legal and financial risks. Thank you very much, Isabel. That's uh, that's that's very clear. Um, I, I wonder if, uh, if if Jacqueline is is available to to answer a question, and, and if not, uh, I, I understand she may actually have a hard stop and off to another uh, meeting. But um, if uh, oh you you are oh, you have to go. Okay, no no problem at all. Unfortunately, I, I do have to. The, yeah, the we we will we'll we'll ensure Jacqueline that uh, we we have those questions uh, off to you. Thank you very much for your participation. Uh, listen, folks, um, I, I think, um, as you can see from the, the, the volume of questions in the, the Q&A, um, a, a very uh, important and engaging topic, um, as, as pledged at the start, will ensure uh, to all audience members who have asked questions that um, uh, panellists will follow up uh, with their uh, responses. Uh, I think about 90% of questions have already been answered. Um, so that's uh, that's great. We're we're working in real time here in multiple time zones. So that's um, effective communication and and, and great spirit. Uh, so without um, further ado, I'd, I'd like to bring this uh, this uh, panel uh, meeting and webinar to a close. And and um, on behalf of the Institute uh, for Peace and Diplomacy and Intervistas Consulting, I'd, I'd like to truly thank um, uh, Isabel, Ellen, John, and uh, and Jacqueline. Uh, for for their um, their great spirit and their uh, uh, you know very insightful words and, and their participation today, it's uh, I think we've had a very valuable um, uh, exercise here. And, and, and thank you to to Solomon, um, our head at Intervistas, and and Vijan and team at the institute for um, hosting us today. And uh, we look forward to many other opportunities to engage with uh, the globe, especially in these COVID times. And uh, without further ado, I'd just like to uh, bring the meeting to a close. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a good rest of morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And hopefully we'll see you soon in this space again. Take care. <laughs>